Hi, and welcome to episode 10 of my Samantha Smith series. And this one's going to be about the man on the screen here. This is Robert John Bardo. And Robert John Bardo was the man who murdered the actress Rebecca Schaefer, who was on the television show My Sister Sam in the late 1980s. And you, you would think that uh, it's odd that I'm bringing this man up in, in a Samantha Smith series, but the bizarre connection to Samantha is there. And before he was stalking Rebecca, he was actually stalking Samantha in 1984, 1985 time period when he was 14 or 15. And he had actually gone to, to Manchester, Maine to find Samantha. So there is a connection there. And it, it's also odd. You might think that I'm bringing this up now instead of when I go, when I talk about Samantha's life, which I will do, I'll talk about her life, not the mainstream version, but the parallels of her life with what was going on behind the scenes in parallel. So I will talk about that. And I probably will bring up Robert John Bardo again at that point, but there's a point to bring him up now. And we'll see this by the end of the video and you'll understand why I'm bringing him up now. But anyway, we'll start with uh, Re Rebecca Schaefer. And this is her on the screen. She was born in Oregon in 1967. And before getting on My Sister Sam, she actually tried a modeling career and moved to New York City when she was in her teens. And then she actually moved to Japan at one point, trying to model there, and then back to New York City. And she wound up getting a part on One Life to Live, the soap opera. And her modeling career fizzled, and she wound up moving back west and eventually got the part in the television show in 1986 with Pam, Pam Dover. So that, that's where Robert John Bardo comes in at this point. He wound up being obsessed with Rebecca, and he started writing her letters in 1986. And one letter she responded to, and, and this is something that, that Robert John Bardo had said himself. I, I don't know if they ever found this letter, or not, but she wrote back and said, Robert, your letter was the nicest and most real letter I ever received. And that, that's from Robert John Bardo's mouth. So he thought in his mind that, that she was making a connection with him and that they, they could actually be friends. So in 1987, he went to Warner Brothers Studios in Burbank, California, which is where they were shooting the television show. And he wound up getting stopped by the security guards at the gate. He had had some roses and a teddy bear that he wanted to give to Rebecca. But they stopped him. And, and Bardo claims that the security guards actually took him for a tour of the studios before he wound up leaving. And so he wound up going back home and was still obsessed with Rebecca, continued writing letters to her. And he actually went and, and tried to find where she lived unsuccessfully. And then in 1989, he had contacted a private investigator who wound up finding Rebecca's address through the DMV. And later, after, after all this happened, they, they wound up making some laws that you couldn't do that through the DMV and some anti-stalking laws and all of that. But he got her address, and then he went to her apartment in 1989. This is her apartment here. And he went up to the door, knocked on it. Rebecca came down. They had a short conversation, and then she said goodbye and left, and, and Robert jo John Bardo left as well. But in his mind, he thought that there could be something more based off of the conversation that they had that he thought was positive. So he went back, and, and this is how the story goes. I, I'm not sure. May, I, I almost believe that he was going to kill her to begin with, but she came, he knocked on the door again, and she came down the stairs, and apparently... In Robert John Bardo's words, she looked annoyed. So when she opened the door, he opened fire on her and shot her in the chest and didn't kill her immediately. And she went to the ground and was screaming and Bardo took off. So Rebecca Schaefer was, was brought to the hospital and, and died there. And Bardo wound up going all the way back to Tucson and the police wound up picking him up, walking aimlessly on the freeway. I guess he'd called his sister in Tennessee and she had called the authorities. So they, they picked him up and brought him in. And so when they brought him in, what wound up being revealed as well, and that, that's the connection to Samantha here, 
and I'll, I'll read it from, from the newspaper clipping here. Police in Los Angeles heard from sources that about four years ago, Bardo ran away from his home in Tucson to, to Manchester, Maine to be near Smith. According to reports, Bardo was picked up by suspicious police near Smith's house and returned him to Tucson. Dan Andrews, a Los Angeles police homicide detective, said he heard the Samantha Smith story from an acquaintance of Bardo. Andrews said he heard that Bardo had traveled to Manchester, was found near the Smith home, and was returned to his parents. Further, though, Detective Sergeant Charles Armio said Bardo's father, Philip A. Bardo Jr., told Tucson police after his son's arrest that the son had developed the obsession about Smith and had run away to find her. Armio said the detectives were told that Bardo had gotten within several blocks of the Smith home, but was picked up by police when he asked for directions. So, so very, very bizarre and scary connection that he has with Samantha here. And so he had developed this, this uh, obsession with Samantha before Rebecca. And so it kind of brings up the question, was he stalking Samantha to kill her as well? But I won't go into that right now. But at any rate, after, after all this came out, they had a man named Park Dietz. Uh, not that. This guy here, who was a forensic psychiatrist, he had actually worked with John Hinckley as well. And he was brought in to, to look over Bardo. And during their conversations, the book The Catcher in the Rye came up. And Bardo, after he had fled the scene, had actually thrown the book on top of a, a building. And they found the, the book up there. So he was obsessed with, with, with Catcher in the Rye. And he talked about this with Park Dietz. And this is going to bring up what I'm going to start talking about now is, is a whole mind control aspect and MK Ultra and all that, that most people know about the programs through the CIA that came out, uh, discussed heavily in John Mark's book, The Search for the Manchurian Candidate, where he talked about the documents that were found after Watergate. And he, it's an excellent book if you haven't read it, that details what the CIA was doing uh, w with this program. But anyway, they, they were talking about The Catcher in the Rye. And The Catcher in the Rye <clears throat> was by J.D. Salinger. And he was part of the OSS, I believe, or intelligence with the U.S. So he was tied in with intelligence. And he wrote this book, I believe, in the late 1950s. And he, he was heavily into Eastern philosophies. And, and you see this starting to sprout up in the 1950s a lot, the Eastern religion and philosophies like Buddhism and, and Hinduism and all that. <clears throat> and he was heavily influenced by that when he wrote this book. And a lot of the, the Beat Generation authors like Jack Kerouac and Allen's, Allen Ginsberg and all of them were very much into this. And if you recall the movie Rebel Without a Cause in the 1950s, I don't know if Nicholas Ray was was influenced by this. I don't. I, I'm not sure about that. But that, all of this stuff, the Beat Generation, the Catcher in the Rye, uh, Rebel Without a Cause, were all influenced by by this Eastern philosophy. And what they detail mostly was was alienation and the the rift between kids and their parents and all of this. And that that was the theme of the Catcher in the Rye. The Catcher in the Rye is also linked to Mark David Chapman, who I brought up previously, who shot John Lennon. John Hinckley had it in his apartment after he shot Ronald Reagan, and Mark David Chapman actually had it on him. So th this topic has been discussed, and, and there's probably a lot of stuff out there. Um, I'm not an expert on this, and there's probably other videos that are devoted to this entirely, but I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail with it. But something about this book has inspired people to kill. And that's the question, what is it about this book? And and when Bardo was talking with Park Dietz about it, Park Dietz had said he'd read the book. I've read the book. Millions of people have read the book. Bardo read the book. And he, Bardo couldn't find what the, uh, the tie to this book was to why these other people had had it on them as well when they killed. So, so the question... It, this book, the whole entire theme of it is basically alienation. And and so maybe the entire book itself, after reading it, would trigger certain personality types. I, I don't know about that. There, there are some interesting things that I that I found with Catcher in the Rye, though. Um, in the last chapter, there's, there's a paragraph here that Salinger writes. 
Holden Caulfield's the, the main character in this. And he says, a lot of people, especially this one psychoanalyst guy they have here, keeps asking me if I'm going to apply myself when I go back to, to school next September. It's such a stupid question, in my opinion. I mean, how do you know what you're going to do till you do it? The answer is you don't. I think I am, but how do I know? I swear it's a stupid question. That, that's an interesting paragraph to me because with these people that that did the assassinations, ass, ass, assassinations that I brought up before with John Hinckley, Mark David Chapman, now Robert John Bardo, Hinckley, I'm not sure if he had doubts of, about whether he was going to go through with it. I'm not sure about that. But I know for a fact that Mark David Chapman had, go, had visited John Lennon first didn't kill him and then went back and killed him. And it's similar with Robert John Bardo. He went there, did not kill Rebecca Schaefer, went back again and then killed her. So it's very interesting because it does tie into this, this paragraph because there's something about that. How do you know you're going to do something before you do it until you do it? And I wonder if, if that, that paragraph has something to do with, with the idea of this, because there was some hesitation on on, the, on their parts, but they did wind up doing it. Uh, another thing that I found in, in Catcher in the Rye, and this this is going out there, but I thought I'd bring it up because it, it is interesting that I, that I found there before towards the end of the book, when he's um, he says in the book that it's ten after twelve, and that that was there, and that was something that 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 caught my attention because. If you've ever seen the, the movie Eyes Wide Shut, and I, I know there's a lot of stuff on that movie as well, and it's a fascinating movie. Obviously, it has mind control over, over themes to it throughout the movie and the rainbow and all that stuff, but I'm not going to go into it. But the 10 after 12 thing, if you remember when Tom Cruise, after he visits the lady whose father passed away, he's walking down the street and... A prostitute comes up to him and she asks him what time it is and he says it's 10 past 12. So and that in at that point in the movie is when Tom Cruise goes through his whole dreamlike uh scenario where he hooks up with the prostitute, well almost does, and then the whole thing about going to the party, all that. I don't want to ruin the movie if you haven't seen it, but that's when it all started for Tom Cruise, right after he says 10 after 12 to the prostitute and the prostitute's name is domino in the movie which obviously the dominoes start falling there, there's a lot to that movie but i thought that was interesting because that is stated in the book in the next to last chapter in catcher in the rye as well but really it's probably the, the overriding theme of the book that it's about alienation just like all the beat generation writers and all of that and and breaking away from the parents and, and that eastern philosophy that uh, you see even in books later on, like Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, and the Beatles brought that brought this in heavily in, into Western culture as well. So, so there's probably something there. I I'm not going to go into it too deeply here. It's not something I find it fascinating. I do, but anyway, so so there there could be some connection there with with mind control with Robert John Bardo, but when he was talking to Park Dietz as well. Bardo brought up the book, The Love You Make, which was by Peter Brown, who was associated with the Beatles. And, and the last chapter is about the John Lennon assassination. And that's where Bardo saw the that he had the catcher in the rye. And also he, he resonated with Mark David Chapman because they both came from military families. And when I read that, that it really, really peaked. Uh, it will brought me back to this book here. It's a book called Program to Kill by Dave McGowan that I read many years ago. And in this book, McGowan talks about mind control, but he really associates, if you see the list of names on there, I don't know if you can read them, but it's, they're all serial killers. And what he was finding was a pattern between serial killers and coming from military backgrounds or being connected to the military and having trauma and child abuse when they were young. And I found that, that Mark David Chapman also was uh, trauma and abused by family members, I believe. I'm not sure exactly what, but he he had that as well. But he also came from a military family. McGowan doesn't talk about the lone assassins, the lone gun assassins like Mark David Chapman and them. But they almost could fit into this as well, as Mark David Chapman came from a military family as well. And he was also, if you remember, I brought up um, 
what was it uh <laughs> that that christian uh world vision and you wonder about that and, and i'm talking about this and you may think i'm going off off track completely off of samantha but a lot of this stuff i'm talking about now is going to come up again and not necessarily world vision but other christian organizations and and their links to all of this but this book was interesting and and he details what mind control really is and he does it very well in an introduction and from what i gather what what mind control is which started with with george estabrooks he had a book about hypnosis and creating super spies and all of that but how it's done is you take something called a dissociative state and everyone is has probably gone through that at one point or another um the the example that mcgowan uses in his book is you get in your car you drive to work you get there and you can't remember how you even got there right i mean a lot of people have probably gone through that and that's a dissociative state you don't remember you were on autopilot and and that's basically what mind control is it's taking your it's detached from your core personality you have a core personality and when you go into these dissociative states it's almost creating an alternate personality in a way and you can't remember these things so the the, the basics of it is how to capture these alternate personalities and control them and that's basically what what mind control is all about and one of the best things to do, and Esther Brooks brought it up in his book, Hypnosis, is through hypnosis and getting you into those dissociative states. So say you drove to work, you don't remember, but you go you go to a, a psychiatrist and they put you under hypnosis. They can bring the memory of your trip back and you can describe to them how you got to work. But when they snap you out, you don't remember. But now these people who had you under the hypnosis have that information. And and I think that's kind of how this is all, it's all worked. You, you can go through the MK Ultra program and the CIA, like I said, all detailed. And there's, there's a lot of stuff on that, a lot of stuff. And so what, uh, getting sidetracked here. So what, what I'm, what I'm talking about is that there's a possibility was Bardo under some form of mind control. And he did come from a military family. And I have here, his father was, was in the Air Force. He was, uh, he was an NCO in the Air Force. He was a sergeant at Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma in the 1960s. Uh, there, there's some links to the Monarch Mind Control through Tinker Air Force Base that I saw. I'm not sure how legit they are, but he was uh, in the Air Force Logistics Command Mission. He was also at Amarillo Air Force Base in Texas. Thule Air Force Base in Greenland, where he was with the 74th Fighter in Inceptor Squadron, which is, if you go back to where that originated, it comes from from intelligence. It basically started with the uh, first American volunteer group that that was an Air Force that worked with the the Chinese Air Force originally in the Sino-Japanese War and then in in World War II as well, and. It splintered off into something called the Flying Tigers, and there was a 14th Regiment and a 23rd Regiment. And the, and the 74th Regiment was tied in with the 23rd Regiment. So, But I, I'm, I, I'm bringing this up because it, the, it's, the Flying Tigers will come up again, and that they were tied to the CIA and all of that. And uh, a man named John Birch, who I'll bring up, uh, I don't want to go into that now, but all of this stuff will come up down the road. But my point is that that Bardo's father was heavily, heavily in with the military, and Bardo had trauma and child abuse as a kid, so he fits the pattern. Um, whether whether he was is a whole other story. And, and another interesting thing that I just thought of was the Bardos were Buddhists. Uh, his father, Robert John Bardo's father, Philip, claimed that they were Buddhists. So there's that Eastern influence. Eastern religion and philosophy influence in there as well. So, so I guess the, the question that would be asked is if he was stalking Samantha, was he intending on killing her like Rebecca Schaefer? Was he controlled or was he not? And th it's a question. And that that's kind of where I'm going with this as, as we'll see through my research. I found that, that Samantha was possibly targeted even as early as the spring of 1984, which would have been around the time of her, her Walt Disney special that she was doing the political show that she did. And, and I found some, some, some clues to that, 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 that could be possible that, that she was being targeted even that early. 
And I'll talk about that down the road as well. But my my personal opinion is that I don't believe that Bardo was going to to was stalking Samantha to kill her. I, I don't believe that. And I'm not sure how much mind control there was there. But it really this the topic and Robert John Bardo brought up all of this about mind control. And and there's one aspect of it that I'm really interested in and fascinated about. And, and I'm not an expert on this. And there's not a whole lot about this concept, but it's the concept called called a sleeper, which I think if you, if you remember the movie, The Manchurian Candidate, there's, yes, the Manchurian, well, that's the book written by Robert Kahn. But there, there was the movie as well, and it starred Frank Sinatra, and the Queen of Diamonds was a trigger card. This person was under mind control and was a type of sleeper, which was you, you send, you get, you, you get control of them through mind control. And then you send them into a situation where they could be anything, like a doctor or a waiter or a bartender or whatever. And then there's something that would trigger them to carry out a mission. And and with the Manchuria candidate, which which was based off of, of U.S. soldiers that came back after a Korean War who seemed like they had gone through some sort of mind control in Manchuria. And the the, the story was that this card would trigger that. And so, so th- it's a very interesting concept to me, the sleeper. And there, I can't find a whole lot of information on it, but it's something that really fascinates me and, you know, could possibly come up down the road. But anyway, going back. Uh, so I don't think that, that Bardo was going to kill Samantha, but it brings up, okay, if you were going to take Samantha out, how would you do it? And that, that's where I kind of wanted to go with all of this and why I brought up Robert John Bardo. And I don't think that you would want her to be assassinated at such a young age. I mean, that, that it's bad enough that, that we're talking about her being taken out. And this is a dark, dark subject, I understand. But I feel like we need to talk about it. And so I don't think that's a scenario. There's other, like a car crash, hard, hard to control. I'll, there's other ways. But a plane crash is something that has probably been used more often than not, that more than people realize a lot of plane crashes are probably not accidental. And so, so that is probably the easiest way to take someone out and make it look like an accident, like that, it that it wasn't intentional. And so I, I think that's basically the gist of it here. And, and with the plane, that's something that, that Samantha traveled on frequently all the time wherever she traveled bar harbor airlines they knew what plane what plane she was on they knew all this they knew where she would fly they they could control that and then you talk about ronald reagan and his control that he have had over the air traffic controllers that he took control in the early 1980s and then you look at the head of the ntsb was a man named james burnett who was handpicked by ronald reagan this was Ronald Reagan's guy, and you've now you've got control over the investigation. Even you've gotten control over the the air traffic controller. You've got control over the investigation. You all you need is control over taking the plane down. And so so that's kind of where I wanted to go with this. It's a good introduction, I think, now to where I'm going to go, talking about the plane crash and all of the oddities with it and the severity of it and the cover up that seemed to be happening with, with the investigation. And like I said, with, with James Burnett, Ronald Reagan's guy, there were agendas being pushed, all kinds of things. So, so this kind of, it does segue right into the plane crash. And, and my next video, I'll start off with a brief overview of, of the day of the crash and all of that. And we'll go through that, but before getting into the details. So I just want to end it here. And uh, hopefully you like this video and it's a, it's a fascinating subject, all of this. I think it is. And there's a lot of information out there on it. And like I said, a lot of the stuff that I brought up in this video is going to come up again down the road. So I'll see you in the next video. Uh, we'll start with t- talking about the plane crash. And I'll see you then. All right. Thanks. Bye.